So in the previous lecture, we looked at the Thonian problem, we defined the Thonian problem, but we told that uh, the central problem is determining equivalent states um, of a composite, of, a, of an isolated composite system containing several subsystems that are separated by a wall. So it is an isolated composite system, that is the overall system is isolated. That means it cannot exchange matter and energy with the surrounding. However, the system is a composite system that is contains subsystems like alpha and beta and the substances are separated by a wall. The wall initially has this internal constraints such as rigidity, impermeability and adiabatic. Right? Adiabatic means it does not allow heat transfer. Then if you remove these internal constraints, you want to see what will be the equilibrium states, um, how the equilibrium state of alpha and beta will be defined. Now the equilibrium states will be defined in terms of, you can define in terms of temperature, pressure, you can define also in terms of extensive variables like u, v, n, right. So now uh, comes the, the, the first postulate where we define this entropy function, which is a function of extensive parameters u, v, n, n, and we tell that um, uh, the entropy of each subsystem is a function of extensive parameters of that subsystem. And we tell entropy is an additive function, right, and is an expressed property, it's an additive. And we tell that the values assumed by this extensive parameters u, v, and n, in the absence of any internal constraint, are those that maximize the entropy of the manifold of constrained equilibrium states. That means the values assumed by u, v, and n, um, n1, n2, n3, uh, in different subsystems, are the value, uh, are those values in absence of any internal constraint are those values that will maximize the entropy, right? Now, if you think of the total entropy of the system, right, of the composite system. Now, when I talk about maximizing, we are talking about extremizing a function, right? When we extremize a function, first thing that we do is we look at, we check that the function, like for example, here the function is s, so ds has to be equal to zero, right? That is the extremum condition and that is what we solve for and then we check whether this extremum condition corresponds to the condition that is extremum, whether it is, uh, whether the second derivative that is d2s is less than 0 or greater than 0. If it is less than 0, then definitely it is maximum. If it is greater than 0, then it is a minimum, right. So if we tell the d2s is less than 0, that means entropy is maximized and in the, uh, when entropy is maximized, the, the equilibrium state described by these values of these extensive parameters in the in the in the in the subsystems are the uh, will give us the equilibrium condition or the equilibrium between phases or equilibrium between the subsystems right that is the idea so um, uh, so that is the most that is the key problem or central problem of phase equilibrium right that's the central problem of phase equilibrium now uh, and i also told that see if you have these subsystems these subsystems or uh, we can call these subsystems as phases because these subsystems are chemically homogeneous, right, and physically they can, uh, they can be considered as phys chemically homogeneous, physically distinct, that is having distinct uh, prop physical properties like density and uh, so on, and they are also mechanically separable, right, mechanically separ separable. So these are your phases, and phase and subsystem, I will show that the phase that we are talking about and we are talking about multiphase. So, in multiphase is nothing but like, uh, but subsystems separated by these boundaries or phase boundaries or wall and this wall basically uh, you can impose constraints on them and then you can remove the constraints or relax the constraints and you can find out the equilibrium state. Now, one thing you have to remember that in uh, macroscopic thermodynamics, in macroscopic means the way we are talking about right we haven't yet connected it to the microscopic uh, uh, we have done some molecular interpretation but we will go further into that but before we go into connecting the uh, my uh, the, the, the microscopic world of atoms and uh, molecules uh, with the microscopic thermodynamic uh, quantities we have to tell this that in macroscopic thermodynamics or uh, Right in microscopic thermodynamics, the, the 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 if one can describe the 
द कंडीशन और स्टेट राइट कंडीशन इज स्टेट ऑफ अ सिस्टम राइट यूजिंग ओनली थर्मोनेमिक वेरिएबल्स दे कैन बी एक्सटेंसिव वेरिएबल्स दे कैन बी इंटेंसिव वेरिएबल्स बट इफ वी If he can describe the state of a system by using only a only variables, then basically what you are describing. So, if one can describe the condition, also a system is only thermodynamic the variables. What you are basically describing is a thermodynamic. So, we are. So, if one can describe that, so basically that is equivalent to this is. basically the equilibrium state now this equilibrium state is in so one of the equilibrium states it can be a constrained equilibrium it can be an unconstrained equilibrium unconstrained equilibrium is the one where you have removed all constraints right you have removed um, the constraints that you impose in the walls if you remove that but whatever it is either constrained or unconstrained if we can describe the state of a system using only thermodynamic variables then then what we describe uh, one this one basically describes a thermodynamic so it is one equilibrium so it may be a constrained equilibrium but it's a one therm a thermodynamic equilibrium state of the system and therefore when i talk about this uh, axiom of maximization of entropy what i am talking about is that you have overall there is an isolation right overall the, the system is isolated so in this So, I think in the symbols, you can see here like this. When I give this, marks here on the boundary. So, what does this mean? This is hashes mean basically that uh, this means the overall the system is isolated. Right, overall it is isolated from the surroundings, right? Uh, but this is the wall, right? wall, and you remove internal constraints on the wall. So that means you make the wall flexible, you make the wall imper uh, permeable to the exterior matter, and also the thermal that is relaxed with energy. Then you have, say, for example, this is alpha and beta, so which contains U alpha. Which can be described as u alpha, v alpha, and say n i alpha, and here is u beta, v beta, and n i beta. These values, okay, in absence of this internal constraints, are the values. These two, these values will basically maximize the entropy. So when I tell you maximize the entropy, that means for these values. ds of the overall system or the overall system will be equal to zero right that is the first condition that's the extremum condition then you can go to the second condition that is the d2s will be less than zero right so that it means that entropy is maximized now comes thus another thing that we told that it has to be continuous and differentiable and monotonically increasing function of energy right it's a continuous function of energy right s is a continuous function of energy it's a monotonically increasing function of energy that is del s del u has to be greater than zero del s del u has to be greater than zero right that's uh, so the partial derivative is greater than zero and it is continuous and differentiable that means if i know s as a function of energy and n Right. If I know S as a function of V and N, 
I can also define u as a function of s, v, and n. By the way, we have done that. Say, for example, when we have written, so for a single component system, when we have written du equals to p d s minus p d v, that is the combined statement of first and second law, we could express ds as 1 by p d u, right, ds is 1 by p d u plus p by t p by right, plus p by t d v, right. So, both are possible, right, you can write u as a function of s and v and s as a function of u and v because s itself is a continuous and differential function of internal energy. Not only that, s is a monotonically increasing function of u, right, del s del u has to be greater than c, right, as a function, uh, when v and all the species small number are kept constant, del s del u has to be greater than c. Another thing, since it is an extensive parameter, since it's an extensive parameter and it's a function of other extensive parameters u, v, n, now you can think of S as a homogeneous first order function, right? This is called homogeneous first order function. S itself is an extensive uh, variable, that's why it's a homogeneous first order function of extensive parameters. That means S is a function of u, v, n1, n2, n r, right? Now, if I multiply u by lambda u, means I am just basically using Mm, lambda as the uh, multiplication the, the, the parameter. So, I am changing u to lambda u, v to lambda v, the n1 to lambda n1. So, lambda can be a, a fraction, lambda can be a whole number like if I put lambda equal to 2u, say for example s. So, if I think of an example, s and instead of u, I am telling it is 2u, 2v and say 2n1 so, it is a binary system say 2 and 2 is the same as writing 2s, 2s, u, v, n1 and n2. That means, if I have changed the mole number by twice, mole number of each species by, uh, by two times and u has become 2u and v has become 2v. So, I have basically extended, means I have basically uh, ex uh, change, change the extent of the system, right? Instead of u, I have doubled it to 2u. Instead of v, I have doubled it to 2v. Even the mole numbers of each species have been doubled. Then, basically, this means the entropy itself has been doubled, right? So, that is the idea. So, it is a homogeneous fast order function. So, this is basically what we are trying to say here is this, this lambda, basically, it is so, if I tell homogeneous nth order function, then it is lambda to the power n. Here, lambda n equal to. Now, if I tell homogeneous first order, so if I tell this way, say z, I will say it's a function of x and y, and I am telling that z is a function of. Uh, a homogeneous nth order function of x and y, then if I just multiply lambda, lambda y, this will basically give me a lambda to the power n, z. Now, it is first order, that means n equal to, right? So, z is a homogeneous first order function of x and y. Z is a first order function of x and y. x, right, so here n equal to n. Now, let us put lambda equal to 1 by n. n is the, say n is basically the total number of moles, right, so you have n1, moles of species 1, moles of species 1, or component 1, and then l2, moles of it is called this component. So, moles of component 1, it is a chemical component 1, and n2 moles of component 2. Similarly, you are taking nr moles of component 1.
Then the total number of moles is n, which is n1 plus n2 plus the dot dot plus. Now I have put lambda to be 1 by n, which is basically 1 by summation nk where uh, summation over k and k goes from 1 to r, right? Now if that is so, then s. So as I told, see if you look at this definition, s of lambda u and all these things is basically lambda s u v n1 into n. So here it will be s of u v n1 into n1. Here it will be basically, so I have to just put, uh, I can write this as 1 by n s u v n1 n2. Now you see what we are writing it as is lambda is coming here, lambda is coming here. So this is basically 1 by n. So you can write this as s u by n, v by n, n1 by n, n r by n and then you have also an n here because 1 by n has to be multiplied, right? So n into 1 by n is 1, right? So basically what we are telling is s u v n1 into n r, you can immediately follow that we have this 1 by n here also 1 by n, here also 1 by n and here there should be an n because lambda itself is 1 by n, right? Lambda itself is 1 by n. So now if that is the definition, now we can think of this small s u v, say for example if you have a single component system, if you have a single component system, n capital N is nothing but n1, right? You have only one component. So n1 by n is basically equal to 1 because n1 equal to n, right? You have a single component system. So the small s is basically entropy per mole, right? Because there is a total number of moles, right? Entropy per mole and is a function of u, small u, small u is internal energy per mole, small v is volume per mole, right? Volume per mole, which is equal to capital S u small a uh, function of small u small v and v, right so basically what we are telling is that since this expression is true right because n by n is one and u by n v by n so for a single component system the molar entropy is a function of molar internal energy and molar volume and this is not uh, and this is just going to be as is uh, as a function of molar energy and molar volume, right? That is the idea. So u by n is energy per mole. So s, so what are we are trading is s by n is entropy per mole. And we are writing it as small s and small s is called small s. Let me use Small s is this, and small s is capital S by capital N. Capital S is your extensive parameter. Small s is not an extensive parameter, it's per mole, right? And small s is a function of small u and small v, where small u indicates internal energy per mole, and small v indicates volume per mole. And uh, we could have written uh, uh, x1, x2. So if it is a multi component system, it would have been u v and here it will be x1 x2 these are the mole fractions right x r where x1 is to n1 by n and x r goes to n r by n right and the very important thing that comes in that is the third the third the third law basically states what that entropy vanishes right for a perfectly crystalline uh, for perfectly crystalline substances at absolute zero entropy vanishes. What we are telling here is entropy of the system vanishes in the state for which del u del s v n one into equal to zero. Now, what is del u del s? Now, if you look at that, we have already shown that. So when we wrote du equals to del u del s. V ds 
पीएलयूडेल एस वी एंड इस वी रोट एस टीबीएस माइनस पीडीटी एंड एस यू कैन सी डेल डेल एस V is nothing but, and what we are telling that interval system vanishes in the state for which delu del s v is zero. Right now, only thing is I have added another potential that is called the chemical potential. Right, so P is your mechanical potential, T is your thermal potential, and so we have added another new d n. The new is your chemical potential, and now it becomes V n, and here it becomes s comma. n right so we have this s n now this is t so we are telling that s vanishes or s becomes zero when del u del s or t is equal to zero if del u del s v n which is equal to t is equal to zero then s equal to zero for perfectly crystalline substances right that's it now You have defined so basically as S is a continuous and differential and monotonic increasing function of U. You can write U also because of continuity and differentiability with respect to the energy. You can write U as a function of S V N, right? Um, and if you can do that, then we have shown, and this is exactly what I'm writing, because it's an exact differential. Whether it is S, whether it is U, because they all they, they depend only on the state the system. They depend on the initial and final states. They do not really depend on the path. So therefore, these are all exact differentials. So if it is an exact differential, you can write du for a simple system. You can write du because del u del s, keeping v n one in R fixed, d s, and del u del v keeping d v fixed. And then summation i equal to one to r del u del n i or del u del n j j equal to one to r is v n one n k which is not equal to j. Remember, so when I write n j here, when I am writing j here, then what we are fixing we cannot fix j right because we are changing internal energy with respect we are seeing the change in internal energy with respect n j so. What we are fixing is S V N one and all the other species concentration or all the other other species mole number. Say for example N one, N two, N three, N K not equal to J up to N and there is an E J, right? So once we have done that, now you see del u del s exactly what we told is T. Del u del s is T and minus del u del v is T, right? Uh, that's what we have defined. And so pressure is the mechanical potential, temperature is the mm, thermal potential, and chemical potential is del u del n j, where uh, where s v at n one and up to n k k not equal to j, these are all fixed, right? And you get mu j, that is the chemical potential of the j term, for right? So that's the so now you have this equation, and that is the same statement of one point. First law, second law, which is but it includes now components or chemical species, right? So you have Du is T D S minus P D V plus mu one D N one plus mu two D N two similarly plus mu R D N right. Now we also know that uh, so again I am repeating del delta W is minus P D V and delta Q is T D S. This positively heat flux the system which increases the entropy of the system and then positively chemical work. Then if we define the same way, it will be mu D N. Right, delta W C is J equal to one to R mu J D N C. Right, so you have the heat, the the, the 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 thermal work or heat input, and then you have the mechanical work, you have mechanical work, and then you have the chemical. Work, right, now if you see, these are called equations of state. Right, you also require that. Right, you require T as a function of A S V N one, P as a function of A S V N one. So right? these A S V N one to N R, these are all essentially variables. But T itself is not. P itself is not. Mu itself is not. So if that is so, these are called homogeneous zeroth order functions. 
homogeneous zero to order function. So basically, if I multiply s by lambda, v by lambda, so basically there is a multiplication factor. Again, I am trying to change uh, I, by multiplying with lambda. What we are doing is we are changing the extent, right? We are changing the the, the extensive variable, right? Extensive variable definitely it will change, right? If I make less to lambda s, v to lambda v, n one to lambda n one, so what we are changing is the extent of the system. But remember, t does not care about the extent of the system because it's intensive property or a point function, right? It's a point function of all these extensive parameters. As a result, lambda. So this is a homogeneous zero order. So this is basically, so basically what we are trying to say is that if z, uh, let's not call it z, let's call w as an intensive parameter, um, else or v as an intensive parameter, no, not v. Okay, let us call um, small z an intensive parameter, the function of x and y, is a function of x and y. Now I write x is changed to lambda x and this is y. It's homogeneous zero at order, which is lambda to the power zero, z is y, which is z. Right? So it does not, so z which is an intensive, here the small z, which is an intensive variable, does not depend on the, uh, how much uh, I have changed the extent of x and how much I have changed the result of y, which x and y, that x and y are the extensive parameters, right? But z does not change, right? So this is something that is very important and this is something that we have explained when you define intensive parameters, right? Intensive parameters are point functions, you can define the point. Right, so basically, this is it's always it's, it's some sort of a ratio, right? Tell you del s, for example. So these are these are called potentials, so, and these potentials are defined at a point, right? You, you define them at a point, and as a result, they are homogeneous zero order functions of the extensive parameters. Now you can write it in the entropic form, right? You, you, uh, as I told you, that we can write it in terms of uh, s as a function of u v n or u as a function of s v n. So here, for example, I am writing in the entropic form. So ds is del s by del u, vn, uh, del s by del u is nothing but 1 by t, right? It becomes 1 by t, it is identified with 1 by t. Now you have del s del v, which is basically minus p by t. Del s del u, del u del v, and del u del v is, um, del u by del v is minus p, and del s by del u is 1 by, minus, uh, is 1 by t, so this becomes minus p by t. This is 1 by t, minus p by t. And this is mu by t. Del s del n is nothing but del s del u, del u del n, right? You are using chain rule. So you can write this way, del s del n, which is mu by t, right? So you can express ex the, the exact differential d a, the exact differential ds in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, del s del u, del s del v, and del s del n j are the intensive coefficients, right? One is 1 by t, and there is minus p by t, and then mu by t, right? So you have now let us consider what does thermal equilibrium mean. Now, if I have to consider what does thermal equilibrium mean, we are basically considering two simple systems. Simple system means you are only thinking of internal energy, volume, and mole number of uh, uh, species, right? Of different species. Now you have uh, these two simple. Uh, there are two simple subsystems, right? These are two simple subsystems. We are think thinking of. Two simple subsystems. And draw the one. Okay, and I have defined this as one is to one and then substitute two, and this is one. Two and we have say a single component in one. We can do it for multi components also in one and in two. We can do it for like you can do it for n j. 
j equals 1 to r. So, you have like the r species or r components and see and what we are telling is that we are making this wall, this wall that we have here, this wall is rigid. That means it does not adjust with respect to volume changes, right? It does not respond to volume change, right? It does not move, it cannot move, it is rigid. And then I am telling it also is impermanent. That means it cannot, it does not allow any, it does not allow species, it does not allow species to move. So it is rigid and impermeable. But it is diathermal, that means it allows the flow of it. Now, what then, what, see, if, if heat is uh, moving around, right, you cannot, you do not allow the flow of matter, that means um, uh, from, from subsystem 1 to subsystem 2 or from subsystem 2 to subsystem 1, no species can flow, right, there is no way this can flow because the wall is impermeable to the exchange of species, right, exchange of components, right. So, so, so no, there is no um, flow of species that is happening, right, no mixing of species that is happening. No adjustment of volume that is happening. Only thing is diathermal. That means it allows the flow of heat. As a result, internal energy, right, which is associated to uh, the flow of heat, is going to change, right? U1 and U2, right? These two terms are free to change. U1 and U2 are free to change. However, the total energy, which is U1 plus U2, is constant, right? So, what we want, we want to see that the values of U1 and U2 are such as to maximize the total entropy, right, total entropy. And what is total entropy? Total entropy is the sum of subsystem entropies, right, which is S1, it's a function of U1, V1 and all this N1, N2, N3 up to Nr. Similarly, S2, U2, V2, S2 again a function of the excess parameters of the subsystem, right, U2, V2 and all this N2, right, to Nr, right. So, now what we are telling is total entropy is S1 plus S2, right, which is the function of e. S1 is a function of U1, V1 and all, and S2 is a function of this. Now, entropy change, if we think of the entropy change, which is basically we now write that, uh, so we can write this as ds. ds is nothing but del S1 del U1 du1 plus del S2 del U2 du2. However, you Note that u1 plus u2 is equal to constant. So, du1 plus du2 have to be equal to z. Right? So, now you are using du2 equal to minus du. Right? So, from this you can write du2 is equal to minus d. Right now you have ds, which is del s del u. Del s del u is one by t. So del s del u for subsystem one, which is basically one by t of our subsystem one du one plus one by t two for uh, and du two is for subsystem two. But du two is equals to minus du one. Right. So I am substituting here. So here I basically write instead of du two, I write minus. And is of D2, I put D2, right? That's what we have, right? We are substituting D2 by minus D1. So if you do that, then what happens is you get Ds, which is equal to Ds, which is equal to 1 by T1 minus 1 by T2 and common than D1. Now Ds equal to 0 means 1 by T1 should be equals to 1 by T2, right? So, 1 by T1 means temperature in subsystem 1 equals to 1 by temperature in subsystem 2. Or, we can write consistently that T1 equals to T2, right? So, we can immediately write that T1 equals to T2. So, this gives you the condition of thermal equilibrium, right? And this thermal equilibrium is achieved when there is flow of heat that is allowed. Say, for example, if flow of heat is not allowed, then there is no then there is no T1 equal to T2 because the temperatures cannot change because the internal energies cannot change, right? So as soon as we may allow the wall, um, uh, the heat transfer to occur through the wall, then immediately 
there is this thermal equilibrium that got established and that thermal equilibrium basically is a result of extremization of entropy right and we will later show that d2s indeed is going to be negative in this case right so basically this gives you the thermal equilibrium condition so this is your thermal equilibrium remember we are doing we are taking two subsystems if you do take n subsystems the same idea will occur so it will be like if i take system 1 system 2 system 3 and system 4 and in all cases if you have these different walls and all of these walls allow heat exchange then ultimately the, the equilibrium that we get how much equilibrium that we get is t1 t t in system 1 is equal to t in system 2 is equal to t in system 3 and t in system 4 right but if you put constraint of adiabatic then you will have a temperature gradient and really um, uh, uh, you will establish a fixed temperature gradient and this temperature gradient cannot change right it's a constrained equilibrium right but in an unconstrained equilibrium you have all the, temp the temperatures to be equal across all subsystems right now this also gives you a way of looking at driving force assume that say for example i have a subsystem again i have this system composite system properly I have this composite system and in that I have this wall and I have T1 T1 and I have T2 right and I am telling that T in 1 is greater than T in Right? That's what we have assumed. Now delta S is 1 by T1 minus 1 by T2 into right. That's what we have found. Right? T S equals 1 by T1 minus so 1 by T1 minus 1 by T2 into delta S. Now delta S greater than 0, right? The entropy of one system increases, right? It has to increase, right? It cannot decrease during the flow, right? So it, it, it has to increase during the flow, then delta S has to be greater than 0, right? Because it increases during the flow. Now since T1 is greater than T2, delta U1 has to be less than 0. That is, delta U1 is the, delta U1 is associated with the change in internal energy of system 1, right. So, since T1 is greater than T2, right, T1 is greater than T2, right. So, as a result, T2 minus T1, so this, this if, if I write, so 1 by T1, minus 1 by T2 is equals to T2 minus T1 by T1 T2 and remember this is absolute scale so temperatures are all positive for T1 T2 so the denominator is positive but here T1 is greater than T2 Therefore, T2 minus T1 is negative. So, delta U1 has to be negative. That means delta U1, that means the internal energy of system 1, which has a higher temperature, has to decrease, right? And so, if it has to decrease, that means it has to basically release heat, right? And heat has to enter system 2, right? So, heat flows from system 1 to system 2, such that the internal energy of system 2 changes to uh, increases and internal energy of system the subsystem one decreases right so it gives you our natural heat flow direction also and it also tells you there is a temperature difference that heat flow it is such that it will flow from higher temperature to lower temperature this is something again from cautious inequality we have shown that is the same thing is what we are invoking here and you can see that not only uh, this extremization of entropy uh, gives you the equilibrium it also gives you the natural direction for heat flow right so it is a uh, or spontaneous reaction for now think of mechanical so if you now have a uh, if you now have to consider mechanical uh, equilibrium then you make the wall not only diathermal that means not only allow the, the heat exchange but also make it flexible or movable right we have made it movable so we have made it movable so what are the constraints the constraints are total u one plus u two has to be constant and v1 plus v2 have to be constant, right? Although v's can change, right? For a system, subsystem 1 and system 2, v1 plus v2 have to be constant. So, du2 
equal to minus d1, right? Because e1 plus it is constant. And similarly, dv2 equals to minus d2. Now, again, we look at the stream one principle. Now, change basically for stuff stream one is del s1 del u1 d1 del s1 del v1 d1 plus del s2 del u2 d2 that is for substitute 2 and del s2 del v2 d2. Now, del s1 del u1 is 1 by t1 and del s2 del u2 is 1 by t2 um, and you see there is du2, du2 is nothing but minus d1 so you can write 1 by t1 minus 1 by t2 similarly you can write in this case del s del u again from chain rule what you get is p by t so this becomes p1 by t1 and again here dv2 is written as minus dv1 so therefore there is a minus sign and there is p2 by t2 now you can, you can see here this has to be equal to 0 now since du1 and dv1 can change arbitrarily, each of these coefficients, right, this one has to be separately 0, this one has to be separately 0, right. So, so because the change in u and change in v are arbitrary, right, so this has to be separately 0 and this has to be separately 0, so this has to be equal to 0, this has to be equal to 0, so 1 by t1 minus 1 by t2 equal to 0 basically gives you t1 equal to t2. Similarly, now if e1 equal to t2, obviously this equation will give you p1 by t1 equal to p2 by t2. And since t1 is equal to t2, this basically gives me p1 equal to t2. That means the pressures in subsystems 1 and 2 have to be equal, right? when the, again, they were not equal when we did not allow the volume to change. How? By making the wall constrained, that is rigid, right? We did not allow the wall to move. Now, we are making the wall to move and since we are making the wall to move and the total volume is constant, you can immediately see that the, the equilibrium, mechanical equilibrium basically means that the pressures in subsequent 1 and subsequent 2 have to be equal, right? Apart from temperature, so temperature equilibrium is thermal equilibrium. And this is uh, the equilibrium in pressures. The pressures are the same, so P1 equal to P2, right? If there is a pressure gradient, then there will be a flow in, uh, there will be a change in volume, right? There will be a change in volume if there is a pressure gradient, right? If there is a, so if you create mechanic, uh, the pressure gradient, then there will be a change in volume, right? The, the wall will start moving, right? And that is what happens even in weather changes and all. And if you create a pressure gradient, it wants to, the, 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 the overall, you want to release this pressure. And as a result, there is this different, in open systems, there is this flow work that happens. And due to this flow work, you get all these rains and stuff, right? So that's that. Now think of chemical equilibrium. Now think of a rigid, again, you can uh, impose the condition of rigidity. You can impose the condition of rigidity. But you make the wall diathermal and permeable to flow of component 1 and impermeable to flow of all other components. So we are telling, now we are thinking of chemical equilibrium of component 1. So basically I select one membrane which allows component 1 to diffuse or component 1 to uh, transfer between uh, subsystem 1 and subsystem 2 but no, none other component can. And then we are also talking about diathermal wall. That is, the, the, the diathermal wall means that we are allowing heat flow, right? Heat flow is allowed and flow of species 1 is allowed. Now, if you have that, you have 1 by T alpha du alpha. So, you have two subsystems. Again, the subsystems are alpha and beta. The subsystems are alpha and beta. Right, and it's overall isolated. Now you have 1 by T alpha, D U alpha, and mu alpha by T alpha, D N alpha, D N 1 alpha, right? We are only allowing flow of species 1 or exchange of species 1 between subsystems alpha and beta. And 1 by T e beta, D U beta plus 1 by mu 1 beta by T beta, D N beta. Again, D U beta equals to minus D U alpha. Why? Because U alpha, since U alpha plus U beta equals to constant. Similarly, n1 alpha plus n1 beta equal to constant. 
So d n one beta equals to minus d one alpha. So again we can see from this equation, from this equation, if you just change d n one alpha and this is d n one beta, which is nothing but minus d n one alpha. So you have again and d u d u beta is written as minus d u alpha. So you basically rearrange this equation and you get. This one, and you get one by t alpha minus one by t beta d u alpha, and mu one alpha by t alpha minus mu one beta by t beta d n one alpha, right? Because I have substituted d n one beta by minus d n one alpha, so immediately I get these relations: one by t alpha equals one by t beta, which means t alpha by t beta, and mu one alpha by t alpha equals mu one beta by t beta, which implies mu one alpha equals mu one beta. Now the chemical, as you can see, chemical the the the, the equilibrium is such that the equilibrium is such that n one will change such that the chemical potential of component one in alpha subsystem should be chemical potential of component one in beta subsystem, right? Or you can think of this as alpha phase and beta phase, and and you can see that mu one alpha should be equals to mu one beta at equilibrium. Now you can extend it. To uh, multi-component system. So next time I will talk about another important relation called Gibbs Duhem relation. So so we can see now that for simple systems, by just uh, extremization of entropy, we can understand the chemical equilibrium, the mechanical equilibrium, and thermal equilibrium. So uh, if you have multiples of systems, say alpha, beta, gamma, so basically or alpha, beta, gamma, delta, the equilibrium conditions are like T alpha equals to T beta. Equals to T gamma equals to T delta. Similarly, mechanical equilibrium indicates P alpha equals to P beta equals to P gamma equals to P delta. And for each species, say for example, if I uh, allow different species uh, to be permeable uh, 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 to the flow of different species between the subsystems, we can tell right for each species. Say I have two species and a new one uh, species. The component one and component two. So mu one alpha equals to mu one beta equals to mu one gamma equals to mu one delta, and mu two alpha equals to mu two beta equals to mu two gamma equals to mu two delta. And so, right? If you have R species, so you have to solve all of this. These are your thermodynamic equilibrium conditions for a simple system where we consider. Contributions which are chemical, mechanical, and thermal. We are not considering here magnetic or electrical. So, if you want to ex extend to that magnetic, electrical, or surface uh, the surface contribution stuff, we have to integrate. Uh, we have to also incorporate those into our description of equilibrium. But here we are considering this equilibrium. But what we have found out most importantly is that whether we uh, so that with this very simple axiomatic approach. We neither we do not violate any of these uh, laws, right? And once we do not violate these laws, and we satisfy the laws, right? The total energy cannot change. The total mole number is fixed, and immediately you can see that what follows are the definitions of thermodynamic equilibrium, right? What are the thermodynamic equilibrium conditions in terms of thermal? So thermal equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, and mechanical equilibrium, right? So we get it. Done. So in the next next lecture, we will start with uh, the the the, the Uh, one of the other other another important um, description um, uh, where we will look at Euler equation stuff. So um, till then, so let us understand this and absorb this uh, uh, concepts that I have taught. And I think this will help you in understanding the overall uh, idea of equilibrium and how to achieve it. And this will be a very general general. This is a very general approach, and you can see that you can extend it to uh, the multi-component, multi-phase equilibria. If there are reactions, everywhere you can basically invoke these ideas, and you can apply these ideas, and you can get your uh, results. Okay, thank you. Thanks. For